We are going to sing a song because we are a grassroots movement, and every grassroots movement since the beginning of time has had music. Um, and so the Center County folks have written, we've, we've got some various music musical pieces written by various folks, but today we are honored to have Debbie Trudeau, the uh, one of the Center County coordinators, who is a professional musician. She is going to lead us in a rousing uh, chorus of Yankee Doodle Gerrymander written by herself and by her friend Pamela Monk. So we are going to sing. We are going to sing three stanzas. We are going to sing together because I am not going to sing this by myself. And Debbie will be accompanying us. We will begin. I will help you find your picture. <laughs> Gerrymandered voting districts are a cheat that costs us. Politicians need to know we want a better process. Yankee Doodle, pay attention. Yankee Doodle dandy. Mind the Senate and the House and with your vote be handy. Yankee Doodle goes to vote. It doesn't really Constitution now so we can have real choices. Gerrymandered voting districts are a form of cheating. Politicians must reform or they will take a beating. Gerrymander has to go. This is now worth noting. We need fairer districts now so we can have fair voting. The next speaker uh, helped in identify Mark Felt as the deep throat source for Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. He earned a bachelor's degree in political science at Boston College and a master's in journalism at the University of North Carolina. He has written for The New Yorker magazine, The New York magazine, The Atlantic, The Boston Globe, The Washington Post, USA Today, Rolling Stone, Details. He's, you've heard him on CNN and NPR. He is a digital media fellow at the Wilson Center for the Humanities and the Grady School of Journalism at the University of Georgia. He is the former editor-in-chief of Salon.com. He is a frequent lecturer about gerrymandering. He has written a new book called The True Story. No, this is about the old book. The old book whose name we cannot pronounce in polite company. But how many of you have read Rat Fucked? <laughs> I was horrified when I read it, but it's part of what has kept me here for three years. Please welcome David Daly. Thank you so much. It's good to be in polite company. <laughs> and I've never quite had an introduction quite like that song to be a lead on. So I'm going to do my best to follow that. That is not hard. And it's, it's also not the version of Yankee Doodle that my seven-year-old son sings. Um, it is a real honor and pleasure to be with you here today. This is what a democracy looks like. If you want to understand what has changed in this nation, just look around this room. It's incredibly personally inspiring to me. In the days after the 2016 election, I was often asked how, in a closely divided nation and in closely divided states like this, how all the political power could be on one side, even when that side often won fewer votes. The toxic combination of gerrymandering, closely followed by voter suppression laws passed by these unaccountable legislatures, had tied our democracy into a profoundly depressing double knot of unfairness. It was not easy to see a solution for this anti-democratic crisis that contributed so dramatically to the extremism, the polarization, the hopelessness that plague our politics. 
none of that stopped you. I watched on social media as lines grew around the block on cold winter evenings for fair district events. I read the hundreds of letters to the editor you publish across the state, watched citizens master the intricacies of the legislative process in a state where insiders like to operate behind closed doors, marveled as you collected more sponsors for fair redistricting than any other bill before this capital U. Every single one of you made the state's entrenched political elite tremble. This is the next American Revolution. It is a demand for fairness, the insistence that our vote is our voice, that our district lines are the very building blocks of democracy. It is grounded in the belief that our leaders are temporary, but the people rule, that we have no task more important than preserving this democracy and the hard-won fight over decades and centuries to participate in it. It is about holding our officials accountable to a higher good, even if they come kicking and screaming that winning elections and maintaining partisan control is never as important as ensuring that our institutions are strong, that our elections are meaningful, that our votes count, that they translate equitably into seats, that a majority of Americans standing together win the right to write their own future. The promise of this nation endures because we all believe that embedded at the heart of this experiment in self-rule is the ability to fix what has been broken and we know what has been broken. Pennsylvania, in many ways, is ground zero. We've heard brilliant speakers and activists and organizers all day today tell us about what has gone wrong. What I want to do is renew your faith that your hard work and collective fight can fix it. I want to send you home with some energy and courage and passion. You need to vigorously pursue this fight because Pennsylvania needs you, because this nation needs you. And I know that this can be done because I've spent the last 18 months traveling the nation and chronicling the citizens who, like you, decided they would become the change they were looking for. I've door knocked across Utah and Missouri and Michigan with canvassers who won astonishing redistricting reform in states many shades more red and purple than Pennsylvania. I watched Native Americans across Utah and North Dakota mount frenzied pushes to determine their street address and make themselves tribal IDs when the state legislature demanded the one form of identification they knew they didn't have. I rode the Medicaid Express, a rickety green RV across Idaho with gutsy millennial activists who didn't understand why their legislature wouldn't accept their own tax dollars back from Washington to ensure 70,000 of their neighbors could afford health care. Watched as former felons in Florida, black and white Democrats and Republicans, ex-cons and second chance believing churchgoers, tattooed Trump loving deplorables and radical criminal justice reformers teamed together into a mighty moral coalition funded by both the Koch brothers and the ACLU. <laughs> I talked to the, the petitioners in Maine who had to circulate their signature forms, not once, not twice, but three times in order to, to win a ranked choice voting there. They won. They won big. They won everywhere. Gerrymandering used to make people's eyes glaze over. Now it makes them good and mad. It used to remind people of falling asleep in civics class. Now we are fully woke. We've made real change. We've got the attention of politicians. Sometimes it started with a simple social media post. I'll take Katie Fahey in Michigan. The ballot initiative there that will bring an independent redistricting commission to one of the most gerrymandered states in the nation started with this millennial's social media post. I'd like to take on gerrymandering in Michigan. If you're interested in doing this as well, please let me know. Maybe it connected because of the smiley face emoji that Fahey added next. <laughs> or maybe because gerrymandering in Michigan had severed the connection between the people and the ballot box. But that single post written by a 27-year-old woman who worked as a program manager for a recycling nonprofit pioneered a winning redistricting revolution that marshaled 4,000 volunteers, collected more than 400,000 signatures, and raised upwards of $15 million. Desmond Mead, who launched the Florida rights restoration effort, 
got kicked out of the army for stealing liquor in Hawaii. The death of his mom detoured him into drug addiction. He lost his home. He got arrested on a weapons charge. One afternoon after his release, homeless, still struggling with drugs again, he stood before the railway tracks just outside downtown Miami, decided he was going to jump in front of the next train. A train didn't come that afternoon. He walked across those tracks instead, somehow guided as if by a higher power, found himself a couple blocks away outside of a drug a treatment center, checks himself in, turns his life around, returns to college, earns a law degree. The one thing he could never win back in Florida, though, was his right to vote. Meade began volunteering with the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, quickly became its president and executive director, galvanizing that victorious statewide movement that the New York Times called the most important civil rights triumph since the Voting Rights Act. At a time when our politics can seem weighed down by a profound sense of despair, when the news cycle feeds never-ending exhaustion, it was pretty inspiring to ride alongside those who turned off cable news, logged off of Twitter, and got to work. Idaho's Medicaid for All initiative began after two graduates from a recent, from a, a high school in the northernmost notch of the state, now studying medicine and history, realized that they had organizing skills that might help a much needed school levy pass in their hometown and overcome bitter, well-organized opposition. That victory made them hungry for more, and when they settled on health care as their issue, they painted that 40-year-old RV, christened it the Medicaid Express, and crusaded to every corner of the state collecting signatures. North Dakota's voter ID law, demanding that street ID, which doesn't exist on tribal land, directly threatened the vote of Native Americans. But on election day and in the days before, they fought hard. They, the tribes met every challenge. They printed their own IDs. They had professors geo-mapping addresses. They burned out ID-making machines, trying to get enough of these done in time to cast ballots. And when Election Day came around, turnout in these tribal lands surged by 75, 120 wild percentages in all of these corners of the state. The legislator who wrote the original voter ID bill, he not only lost his bid for a fourth term in office, but he lost to a woman named Ruth Buffalo, the first Native American Democratic woman ever elected to North Dakota State House. These efforts were not led by politicians. They were not led by parties. They began with regular people. While the political media pretended to bust from its coastal bubbles and camped outside Midwestern diners in search of heartland white male wisdom, a new national activism emerged. Nationwide, citizens asked how and where they could contribute. They found answers right in their own hometown. Torches had been lit. Citizens took off sprinting. When state legislatures and local election boards created these complicated ID requirements or they closed voting precincts, even in rural areas, they suddenly started to meet with howls of outrage in rural Georgia and in rustic Kansas, in New Hampshire college towns. But then these local legislators, long protected by the friendly districts, they drew themselves that discourage good challengers and make it hard for anyone to raise the money to challenge them had to run for their lives as a new generation of data-savvy activists, trained newcomers, and young people had to seek office themselves. While the Supreme Court dithered and delayed and finally, bitterly to many of us in this room, slammed the doors of federal courthouses shut on partisan gerrymandering claims, people did not wait for judicial superheroes or democracy-saving silver bullets. They acted. They became the protectors of democracy that we all imagine that the courts should be. None of this is easy. The forces that are lined up against reform, they do not quit. They didn't stop in Florida when 64% of the people, Republicans, Democrats, and independents backed felon reenfranchisement. In Missouri, Utah, and Michigan, those gerrymandered legislatures worked to undo reforms passed by the people. In Idaho, after 62% of the citizenry 
uh, pass that Medicaid expansion, that the legislature responded by making it harder to put future initiatives on the ballot. But here's the good news. Tens of thousands of Idahoans who didn't have health insurance before this fight now do. Michigan might have to figure out how they're going to fund this commission if the, if the politicians are going to monkey around with the budget. But no matter what citizens there are going to draw the lines, fewer Floridians with felony convictions might be able to vote in 2019 than the folks that originally hoped but somewhere between 300,000 and 650,000 have won back their civil rights. Remember the two steps forward before the half step back. After all, the history of voting rights is one of expansion and one of retraction. Our current fight is really just the latest struggle in a fight over the vote that's as old as the nation itself. We might like to imagine that our nation's story is one of ever-expanding suffrage with courts protecting and defending this fundamental freedom. It's never, ever been as simple as that. The struggle for voting did not end with the passage of the 14th Amendment or the Voting Rights Act. This is no time to celebrate. This is no time to rest. The work that remains will get difficult. Opponents are not discouraged, far too many politicians are willing to turn democracy itself into a political football. Frederick Douglass said that power concedes nothing without a demand that the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. So we are going to have to roll up our sleeves and work even harder. So you defeated Medicare, excuse me, so you expanded Medicare in a red state? Fight on defeated gerrymandering and deep-pocketed special interests keep going, won the largest ex expansion of voting rights since the 19th Amendment finally allowed women's suffrage. Your determined adversaries aren't discouraged. They are testing your commitment to the combat that lies ahead. Keeping a democracy, it turns out, requires a lot of work. But what all of these stories show is that when regular citizens unite and fight for the kind of democracy they want, when we put our hands on Martin Luther King's moral arc of the universe and aggressively pull on it, that there isn't a structural barrier that won't buckle. I want to leave you with a story from Alabama about a woman I met named Sherry and the night that she lost her voting rights forever which began like any other teenage evening in late 90s rural Alabama. High school friends piled in a classmate's ride, drive through dinner on the hood of a car, someone passed around a joint, then the sound of a police car rolling over gravel and two white police officers wondering what that herbal odor might be. Plenty of cops might have looked the other way, let those kids off with a warning. In tonier suburbs, no doubt that exact same encounter ended differently for different students who perhaps looked more like their own. Sherry's evening ended with drug possession charges for everyone in the eyes of the state. They were no longer high school students, they were felons. And in Alabama, felons guilty of a crime involving moral turpitude, such as this minor possession charge, an offense so small it would not even be a crime in many states, forfeited their right to vote forever. She was 17. She'd never voted. Now she never would. Her most important right as a citizen erased before she had the opportunity to exercise it. These laws from the Jim Crow era, hardly consigned to history, ensnared her 160 years later. Finally, 160 years uh, too late, under court order, Alabama's legislature ends moral turpitude for all but the most serious crime. But the state was not willing to even update the forms to let people know that they'd gotten their rights to vote back. Citizens started going door to door, bus stop to bus stop, trying to find every single one of these people. It's how I met Sherry and heard her story outside the Birmingham bus station one morning as she waited for a ride to the hair salon where she works. And I approached her and asked if she was registered to vote. She waved me away, embarrassed, uneager to respond, simply told her we were out telling people about a change in the law and that a felony conviction no longer permanently costs you your right to vote. 
I hand her the clipboard with the list of serious crimes and tell her if it's not one of these, she can get her right to vote back right now. We walk her through it, and in two minutes, she is a registered voter again, and we're both in tears. I was 17, she said, and I thought I never, ever would. I will be a lifelong voter. This is who we are fighting for. We are fighting for Sherry nationwide. This nation has been built by the people. It's been improved by the people. Whether this is the women walking for suffrage or the marchers across Selma's Pettus Bridge, progress has been long. Progress has been hard. It has been of our own making. Now that responsibility has been passed on to every single one of us, all of us who believe in principle over partisanship, brought together by the belief that change belongs to us all, that equal protection under the law belongs to us all, that one person, one vote belongs to us all. Let us find hope in the energy and the devotion of our fellow citizens. Let us commit all of us to build a nation in which every voice is heard and carries the same weight. Let us move into these battles ahead bravely and unafraid with open eyes and hearts understanding the challenges but also the stakes, confident that with hard work and constant dedication, the country we want to live in lies within our grasp. There is a mighty unrigging underway and I hope the story leaves you with the same a rebirth of optimism and hope that it did for me. I thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I'm Keith Forsyth. Um, I've been a Fair Districts volunteer since 2016. I was the county coordinator for Philadelphia, and then after that, the chair of the state coordinating team. And now I'm the uh, chair of the advocacy advisor team, which helps the local groups be more effective in their uh, interactions with legislators. Um, it's been it's been a great ride, um, and uh, it's not over yet. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, Stephanie Ostfeld. Uh, she's the director, I believe is the correct title, of the U.S. Office of Global Witness. They work on um, uh, uh, investigating and uh, trying to stop uh, looting and money laundering by public officials around the world. And she's going to talk to us about uh, some other nefarious uh, financial activities having to do with our very own uh, politicians in the state of Pennsylvania. So thank you. That's uh, really hard to follow, so I hope you're all going to be very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank, and I'm a lot shorter, OK. So I want to thank Carol and Fair Districts for inviting Global Witness to join you today. And you know, all of you, really, for taking your Saturday to be here and to get organized. Because I think the more we organize, the more we're going to win. And that was incredibly inspiring, um, You know, the last speech. So there are so many links between the problem you're working to overcome and our work to curb corruption and the undue influence of corporations over the policymaking process, much of which is legal, frequently in plain sight, and has gone unchallenged by lawmakers. So for over two decades, Global Witness has been exposing corruption in human rights and environmental abuses around the world. With in-depth and hard-hitting investigations, we shine a light on political and corporate wrongdoing. We're exposing how corruption undermines the public good. Through strategic advocacy and communications, we work to change the system, close loopholes, and hold the corrupt to account. We've always understood that corruption isn't just something that happens over there in faraway countries. Corruption on the scale that we see in our investigations could not happen without the actions of global facilitators. So that's why in the US, our US office has focused on changing laws to stop US corporations, banks, and anonymous shell companies from enabling corruption around the world. However, over the last few years, the US has stepped back from its leadership role in fighting global corruption by disengaging from international initiatives and by working with Congress to dismantle critical transparency and public interest regulations at an unprecedented pace. 
So over the past few years, the corruption crisis in the US has become too big for us to ignore. And while it's existed for decades, you know, this isn't new, there's a real spotlight on it right now. And the harms caused by corruption in the US political system have repercussions that span the globe. Backsliding by the US government on democratic principles emboldens autocrats to be more corrupt while stymieing efforts to tackle complex global challenges. This endemic government corruption has also resulted in a powerful network of corporate interests with deep pockets who exert influence over elections, policymaking, and the government at every level in the United States. This phenomenon of legalized corruption is thriving due to vast sums of money in politics that's resulted in a broken political system that fails to protect the public interest. The problem of rampant corruption in the US is not only that wealthy individuals or groups can buy or influence politicians, the issue is also that the system itself is fundamentally rigged by those both inside and outside of the government who stand to profit from regulatory and legislative decisions. That includes the politicians and other officials who engineer and benefit from gerrymandering, industry-dominated regulatory agencies, and lax regulations around government transparency. Corruption isn't always just gerrymandering or weakening regulations or corporate spending on lobbyists who essentially buy legislators' votes either. Sometimes it's public officials who unfairly award government contracts to their friends or work to prevent the public from accessing public records or as reported by Spotlight PA, I believe last month, lawmakers who push for less oversight from the Department of State even after a newspaper investigation found that Pennsylvania lawmakers were spending millions of dollars in campaign spending that can't be fully traced, you know, on things like wine in, in Vienna. You know, they only reversed course because of the increased press attention. So investigative journalism, it works. The undue influence of the corporate sector is something we've seen in our work again and again. Just as an example, we've passed a, tra a transparency law about what corporations pay to governments around the world almost a decade ago. It would help curb corruption. And it still isn't being implemented because of the outsized influence of industry. So it's been nine, nine and a half years. This is why we've just launched a new campaign in the United States to expose and reduce the corrupting undue influence of corporate interests over our political system at the federal and state levels, because it all too often leads to policies that harm the public interest and the planet. We're hoping that our work, including investigations, can help ensure that politicians make decisions in the public interest and not in the interest of corporate elites or for their own personal gain. We know there are a lot of great groups working on anti-corruption and democracy issues in the US and in Pennsylvania, including in this very room. So we did extensive scoping to see how we could add value. We don't want to be duplicative. We don't want to be competitive. We want to be really targeted and add value through our investigative work and expertise on corruption. Specifically, we want to expose cases of corporate capture in a handful of states and work with groups on the ground to build support for much needed reforms you know, that these groups are already working for. So while we're planning to focus on issues in a number of states across the country, Pennsylvania is of particular interest for a number of reasons. There's significant corporate capture of the Pennsylvania State Assembly and government agencies, and it's resulting in direct harms to people, community, and the environment. From our conversations and our research, this has been made pretty clear, and it looks like there are lots of stories of this undue influence that just haven't been told. Also, Pennsylvania currently has no limits on the amount of money individuals, state parties, and PACs can donate to political candidates. As long as you're not a corporation or a union, you can give as much money as you want to any official or candidate. And Pennsylvania also has very lenient requirements for what must be reported to the state in terms of lobbying expenses, gifts, providing travel or lodging, and campaign contributions. When you consider that public data shows that there are more than four registered lobbyists in Pennsylvania for every member of the state's General Assembly, and that more than $100 million was spent last year on lobbying, which is really practically half a million dollars per legislator, and that Harrisburg has more pharma lobbyists than any other capital across the country, it leaves a lot of room for a lot of influence peddling that can legally go unreported. So ultimately, these things do one thing. 
They cut the public out of conversations and decision making about their own communities and their livelihoods. While the problem is bad, what's really exciting about working in Pennsylvania is all of you and the many groups who've been working here for years for democracy and anti-corruption reforms. There's a real hunger for solutions here in Pennsylvania. So we want to partner with you. We want to uncover cases of illegal and legalized corruption that show concretely the economic, environmental, and human harms caused by the undue influence of corporate and other vested interests. We've gotten feedback from Pennsylvania groups that exposing corrupting gifts to legislators and other types of corporate capture and influence peddling would be useful. So we want to make sure that the cases we expose will be helpful to the advocacy that all of you are already doing to promote democratic and other anti-corruption reforms. And we're just beginning, we're at the beginning of investigating these issues in Pennsylvania. So we've started to dig into the publicly available data like campaign finance information and lobbyist spending to tell the story of influence peddling. You know, just this week we published an article that exposed how members of the House that voted for a particular tax incentive received six times the amount of funding from the relevant industry than those who voted no. But we want to do more than just look at publicly available data. We'd like to talk to people like you, the members of the community that know and love your state and want it to be all that it can be. The engaged groups who've been in the trenches, challenging things like gerrymandering and pursuing things like gift ban legislation, we'd like to get a better feel for the pockets of corruption we might miss upon first glance. Just last week, we hired an investigator to increase our capacity to do this. Her name is Sal Christ. She's sitting in the second row. Um, she's going to start looking into corrupting gifts and other cases of undue influence of special interests. She's a lengthy background in investigating government and political officials at the state and federal levels. And she places a high value on getting the entire story. So she joins a team that collectively has well over a decade experience working on corruption. So these are all things we think will be assets to our work in Pennsylvania and elsewhere. So we'd love to engage with you in any way we can, whether that's by learning more about what you're focused on, or on issues that you'd like to dig into but don't have the time or resources, or just collaborating on issues. So if you have ideas for us, or tips for us, suggestions for who we should speak to, please, we would love to hear from you and come find us after the session. Thank you. Hello, my name is Justin and uh, I've been involved with Fair Districts for about three years now. My partner Sarah and I have, uh, we're from Northwest Philly um, and we got involved in Fair Districts because we could see, we started to see much of what we cared about was not being addressed because of gerrymandering. So we rolled up our sleeves and here we are. Um, the person that I would like to introduce to you is uh, a community leader on civic and social engagement across PA. Um, he is the executive director of March in Harrisburg, which uh, seeks to uh, end gerrymandering and um, uh, fighting for voting rights and um, uh, sorry. <laughs> And uh, yeah, uh, instituting a gift ban. He's the executive director of March on Harrisburg, and um, he's an activist and tireless, uh, tireless supporter of democracy. Uh, and uh, he's Rabbi Michael Pollack. Great. I forgot my coffee up here. So I'd like to open up with an announcement. This Tuesday at 9 a.m., the House State Government Committee is holding a vote on the gift ban. It will be happening in Irvis Room G50, which is the same room where March on Harrisburg had nine people arrested about two years ago for protesting for a gift ban. <laughs> In 1944, a Polish refugee named Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel sat in an apartment in Cincinnati, Ohio, and he wrote an essay called The Meaning of This War, talking, of course, about World War II. And he asked the question, how did we get here? How did we get here? And he tells a story. He says, 
In this story, imagine a long time ago, there were a group of mountain climbers who were climbing a very dangerous mountain. And they were walking along a, a, a steep rocky ledge and they fell into a pit. And in the pit it was dark, but snakes kept coming out of the crevices and attacking the climbers. And the climbers were taking their sticks and they were beating back the snakes one by one, all the climbers except for one. There was one climber who wasn't helping at all. And the other climbers turned to them and said, why aren't you helping us beat back these snakes? And that climber said, if we stay here fighting these snakes, more and more will keep coming and we'll surely perish. I'm looking for a way out of the pit. How do we get out of the pit? I think a good starting point is to stop thinking about rights. I think rights have gotten us in some trouble. George Carlin, the great stand-up philosopher, once said, <laughs> you have no rights. You have no rights. If you think you have rights, type into Google Japanese internment camps 1942 and you'll see what your rights really mean. If you think you have rights, type into Google kids in cages. You'll see what they really mean. Rights are bestowed upon us by whoever's writing the law. And when we're not writing the law, well, our rights are determined by those who are. I think we need to think more in terms of obligation. Because while rights can be taken away from us with a stroke of a pen, obligations can never be taken away from us. In fact, in the Bible, there is no concept of rights. It doesn't exist. You don't have a right to life in the Bible. You have an obligation to not kill. You don't have a right to shelter in the Bible. You have an obligation to house the homeless. You don't have a right to be accepted in as a refugee. You have an obligation to take in the stranger. And when we think in terms of obligations instead of rights, we start to think in terms of you and not I. Rights begin with, I have the right. Obligations begin with, you must. And that's a, different, that's a big difference. Because with rights, it starts with me. With obligations, it starts with you. And that connects us. And so the question must always be asked when you're talking about obligations and responsibility, well, who's commanding you? Who's obligating you? Who tells you that you have to take in the stranger? Who tells you that you have to feed the hungry? Who tells you that you have to have just courts set up across the land? Who's telling you that? And I don't want to make the case that it's each other. We're telling this to each other. It is the face of the other that commands us, the face of the other that obligates us. The French Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas once said that when you see the face of the other, you are ordered and ordained to service. When we see a suffering human face, we respond with compassion. We respond with responsibility. We respond with service. That is the natural human response. Why do you think it is when charities are trying to get you to, to donate $1 a day to send halfway across the world to a hungry kid, they show you a picture of that kid? so that you see that face and you feel something. Corruption is what keeps us divided. It's what keeps us blind to each other. It's what keeps us from seeing each other. And it's not the only thing. Racism also keeps us from seeing each other. Misogyny keeps us from seeing each other. Corruption blinds us. Corruption, it says in Deuteronomy, do not take a bribe because a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Bribery blinds even the most wise lawmakers that we send to Harrisburg. It deafens the voice of even the most desperate Pennsylvanians crying out for some service. It keeps us from encountering each other. It keeps us from being responsive to each other. And luckily, we know what the antidote is. It's to see each other, which we would also call democracy. Coming together, being responsive to each other, working together. And when we can encounter those in power, and when we can encounter each other across all the lines of division in our society, geographic divisions, racial divisions, sexual orientation divisions, religious divisions, all these divisions, if we can encounter each other across all of these, and if we can encounter those in power and make them responsible to us, responsive to us, to serve us, 
And if we can constantly be encountering our highest and holiest ideals, truth and justice and democracy, I think we might be all right. I think we might be obligated and we'll act from that place of obligation. We won't show up to rallies because I have the right to free speech. We'll show up to rallies because you are obligated to speak out. We can reread all of our rights in terms of obligations. I'm going to leave out the Second Amendment, but most of them we can talk about <laughs> in terms of obligations. Article 1, Section 2 of the Pennsylvania State Constitution says that all governments are founded for the people. All power is inherent in the people, and that you have the right to alter, reform, or abolish our government as we may see proper. That's not a right. That's an obligation. We have an obligation to alter, reform, or abolish our government as we see proper. And when we encounter each other and produce these moments of responsiveness, these moments of service, well, this is the definition of sacrifice. Sacrifice in the ancient world, the, the Hebrew word is korban. And korban means to encounter. It means to draw close to. It can be translated as a hug. And that when we sacrifice, we're not only encountering our highest and holiest ideals, but we're encountering each other through the process. And the hope is, is that if we can see each other through this sacrifice, that we can serve each other and build a better world. The priestly blessing that was said in the ancient temples when sacrifices were offered, it goes like this. May be blessed and kept. May the face of the divine turn to you and be gracious to you. May the face of the divine look at you, and may you be at peace. Sacrifice is about demanding that responsiveness, about putting ourselves out there so that the world will be responsive to our cries, to our pleas. So the question that we're all wondering here, what's going to happen with gerrymandering? And I want to toss into that, what's going to happen with the gift ban? What's going to happen with the House rules? What's going to happen with the ballot initiative? What's going to happen with ranked choice voting? What's going to happen with democracy dollars and public campaign financing? What is going to happen with ending the war economy and taking on militarism and taking on structural racism and taking on uh, ecological devastation and taking on poverty? What's going to happen with all these snakes that are coming out of the crevices? How do we win? The way out of the pit is sacrifice. The way out of the pit is sacrifice to encounter each other. Now there's a story about this that you may all be familiar with the ending of it as an example of kind of how, to, how do you do this. Right? Raise your hand if you've heard the line from Amos, let justice roll like rivers and righteousness like a mighty stream. It's an old line, 2,600 years old. And the secret to how you get there is actually a few verses before that. It says in Amos, go out into the public squares and cry. Go out into every shopping mall, every intersection, every rec center, every government office, every public square, every school, every hospital, everywhere, and cry out. Be heard. Because when you cry out, we'll be naturally responsive to each other. We have to cry out. One thing in the democracy movement that we have to realize is that knowledge only goes so far. It's incredibly important. It is. We need to be right. We need to know our stuff. We need to be researching. We need to know what we're up to. But we need to cry as well. We need to pull on the heartstrings of those in charge. And we need to make them cry. They need to see us cry. And they need to cry with us. And when that happens, justice will roll like a river and righteousness like a mighty stream. And my hope is for us, for everyone in this room, for this movement, for all of Pennsylvania, that we can be in the public squares and we can be the moral defibrillators on the broken heart of America and the stuck heart of Pennsylvania. And we can make America cry again. Thank you.
don't know about you, but I have had a very full day. Um, we have learned new things, all of us, about how our government works, and I hope you are heading home with some new ideas about how to use what you've learned to press for change. As always, we must connect the dots between partisan gerrymandering, lack of representation, corruption, other issues of concern to Pennsylvania voters. If you were in the prison gerrymandering breakout today, you heard that Fair District's PA, the Fair District's PA Executive Committee agreed this week to make a statement of formal support for bills addressing prison gerrymandering, beginning with Representative McClintock's House Bill 940. Since our start, we've looked for ways to address this issue through comment on the Census Bureau rules. That was in 2016. They ignored everybody. And then we have looked uh, for uh, administrative action, uh, meeting with members of the, the Wolf administration. The Wolf administration has committed to having the Department of Corrections ensure that incarcerated individuals have their addresses more correctly recorded. And they are working to come up with a clean definition of an alternative address to be used in the allocation of resources within the Departments of Justice and Corrections. But the administration sees no avenue to ensure that that data is used for redistrict redistricting purposes short of litigation. So at the urging of our Philadelphia, Philadelphia contingent, we will be supporting legislation on this issue. And I do thank the Philadelphia contingent for pressing this issue with the executive committee. It was the right thing to do. And I also thank the Philadelphia contingent for doing it so appropriately. So I will say, in our, in our grassroots movement, I am so appreciative of the fact that, that as many of you see areas where we need to grow, improve, change direction, think things through more carefully, I appreciate how many of you look for the appropriate way to do that, to have a conversation among leaders, to, to put that into words, to ask for rethinking. Um, that was done very well, so thank you, Philly folks. And, and you're right, we, we need to, at this point, choose to to uh, support that, that um, legislation. This is an essential part of ensuring fair redistricting and of great importance to communities whose voices are diluted when their citizens are counted in districts far from home. If you were in the census breakout, you heard we will be looking for ways to ensure a complete census count in communities that are often undercounted. And as a result of that undercount, under-resourced and underrepresented. This includes urban and minority communities, but it also includes rural regions lacking internet access or lacking cohesive civic structures able to spread the word about the importance of the census. This will be an important opportunity for us to work in partnership with new allies in areas across the state. If you were in the Reform the Rules session or the Dig Deeper workshop, you heard we will be continuing our research into the way procedural rules work and looking at best practices in place in other states. We will be continuing to explore the ways money corrupts the process and holds unaccountable power in place in conversation with groups like Global Witness. We will also be learning more about ways to assess maps and find sources of data with help from friends at the Princeton Gerrymandering Project. Some of you will celebrate some of these goals while you disagree with others. Some of you want us to retain a narrow focus on our most important immediate goal, which is passage of the two bills, one commission solution. And some of you worry that we are already stretched thin or that too much complexity will sink our local groups. One of the great strengths of our effort and our movement is we are an all-volunteer grassroots movement active across the entire state with an amazing wealth of backgrounds, abilities, contacts, and resources. Some of us want a single focus. Others see the connections and believe we should pursue them. Let me say, some of us, my husband is one, like to work with a clean desk. And we like one tab open on our internet browser. <laughs> Others, and I am one, work best among piles of projects with so many tabs open, our computers sometimes complain and occasionally crash. My husband will see me working and he'll just shake his head. You have 20 tabs open. And I'm embarrassed, but I'm also honest. That's how I think. I see the connections and I pursue them. 
We need all of us. This movement needs all of us. We need the people like Amy Rufo who say, Carol, here's the project, the plan that you have set out. And I look and say, ooh, hmm, let's rethink. Um, but we need people who say, connect the dots. And we do need to connect the dots. We need to pursue the connections and the complexity. Uh, we need to broaden our coalition. We need to open dialogue with new demographics. But we also need to move forward with care to make sure local groups don't feel overwhelmed and to make sure outreach is always appropriate to the context and remain simple enough to engage newcomers. That's a challenge, and it's one we're aware of. It's one we will continue to work on. It's one we've weathered well so far, thanks to all of you. The more we know about how our system works, the more powerful we become. The broader our base, the more impossible it will be for our legislators to ignore us. The more persistent, polite, and informed we are, the more influence we have among our legislators and their staff. I would like to leave you with three simple thoughts, and I will finish early to Drew's delight, even though he has left with David Daly to meet a train heading towards New Haven. First thought, change in the Pennsylvania political scene is not just possible. At this time, it is inevitable. Our role is to make sure that that change reflects the voices of Pennsylvania citizens and ensures policies that give all of us a fair and equal vote. Number two, communication is essential. We need to listen carefully to each other, to people who appear to disagree, to our legislators. We need to listen carefully, we need to share what we know, and we need to insist on polite, informed, persistent dialogue with people across the political spectrum and with our legislators and elected officials. Third, I say this often and say it again now, there are times when it is totally okay to sleep in your backyard hammock. <laughs> I have done that and I love to do it and it has been a while since I have done that. There are times when it's okay to sleep in your backyard hammock and there are times when you need to jump up, see your house is on fire and run crying out to the neighbors to ask for help and this is one of those times. The next year or two will shape Pennsylvania's future, but it will also in many ways shape the political discourse in other states that are watching us, and it will shape what happens in Congress as well. We need to be asking everyone we know. We need to be crying out in the streets and the schools and, and everything place we can think of in our churches and our civic groups. We need to be inviting people to engage and invest in a future that works for all of us. We all have different levels of engagement and investment. We have different skills and backgrounds, different capacity to engage at this point. We all have lives and families and jobs and other things, um, but all of us are needed to bring what we have to this work. Thank you for your part in this incredibly important work. And I want to stop and say thank you to those who have worked so hard to pull this conference together. I want to thank the Dauphin team. I want to thank Jean Handley. I want to thank Amy Rufo and the communications team. I want to thank our advocacy advisors for the really good work that they're doing. I want to thank our Action Network folks behind the scenes doing amazing work that I can't even begin to understand. I am so appreciative. We have an amazing team doing amazing work. People using their skills, their creativity, their energy in, in terrific ways. We've got a lot of self-starters who just see the issue, see the problem, and go to work and make things happen. We would not be here without every one of you. So thank you all who pulled this conference together. Together, but thank you all who have built this Fair Districts PA movement. You are wonderful. I am really appreciative. Thanks.